I am the new uh, chief in the division of nephrology and hypertension. I was actually here from 94 to 2015, and I just got back in March. So I'm happy, very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to introduce Mike Fryer. Mike's been with the division for 34 years. He started his career looking at pharmacokinetics of drugs especially in people with renal insufficiency or on dialysis. Mike uh, Breyer, Dr. George Aronoff, who's on, on the session two, Dr. Um, Alfred Jacobs and Dr. Gowida have um, taken that knowledge a step further. They have been able to dose erythropoietin in populations using neural networks and artificial intelligence. And they've actually commercialized that, and Davida is using that, I believe, to dose their erythropoietin. So Mike has a long history of looking at renal function and how it affects drugs. And I think he's caught on to a very um, controversial topic that's hot in nephrology right now, and Mike's going to talk about the use of race and clinical algorithms and estimated GFR. Mike? All right. Thanks, Rosemary. So uh, let me just start the talk off by saying I'm, I'm glad that there's a, a chat in the, in the chat box that says someone's excited about this uh, talk because there's a group of internal medicine residents who are working on an advocacy project related to use of race and estimated GFR. So uh, I think that this is good timing. And... Um, We'll just take it from there. So, uh, as Rosemary said, uh, why? Oops, I messed up. Okay. So, uh, what we want to do today is we want to identify some factor uh, clinical equations that use race uh, for decision making. Discuss discuss the rationale for the inclusion of race and other identifiers in clinical algorithms. And recommend one you might consider that. So, why is a pharmacokineticist interested in uh, estimating GFR? So, as Rosemary said, uh, George Aronoff, who was the division chief of nephrology uh, ancient times, in the, last, in the last century, George and I came here to the University of Louisville, and we are interested in drug dosing. And as an aspect of drug dosing, one has to estimate the glomerular filtration rate. And for example, here's vancomycin, a drug that still is used today and still provides problems, I think. Uh, you would make rec different recommendations based on the stage of, of kidney disease that the patient has. And those recommendations typically are not um, uh, uh, exact in, in, for example, in stage three kid CKD, you would give one gram every 24 to 96 hours. And so the closer the patient is to a higher GFR, you might do it every 24 hours. And the closer they are to stage four, you might do it every 96 hours. So there's no, uh, uh, there, there takes um, some um, thought from the physician as to what to do, or in this case, the pharmacist. So when we talk about race, the US uh, government has come up with a definition, and I think it's a, a, a valid definition use, and it's basically how do you identify? And secondly, that race does not reflect, it generally reflects social definitions in the United States and not is not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically. Why do we include race in our studies? Well, as a federally funded investigator, I am required by federal law and NIH policy to give information about how I'm including uh, subjects in certain underrepresented groups historically in clinical trials. That would be women, minorities, and children. If we don't study those groups, we don't know how certain interventions or drugs may uh, affect those populations. Further, the analysis that you have to, that you are required to do needs to incorporate the measures of sex, gender, race, and or ethnicity. Finally, uh, I think this is uh, specifically why we're looking at race from a federal funding perspective and also from a, a clinical perspective. <clears throat> and I'll read this verbatim. Since a primary aim of research is to provide scientific evidence leading to a change in health policy or a standard of care, it is imperative to determine whether the intervention 
or therapy being studied affects women or men or members of minority groups and their subpopulations differently. So that is how the NIH has framed this. So let's look at this from a clinical perspective. Uh, my brother decided to go to the University of Chicago. It was very expensive, so he joined the Navy. So after he left the University of Chicago, he was stationed at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, and he probably could have seen a patient that had these vital statistics as he's looking through this chart, and yet when the patient walks through the door with his 15 uh, Secret Service agents, you see that as President Barack Obama. And the first question that we might want to ask is, what is his race? And from now on, we're going to talk about how that may influence some decisions in, in medicine, uh, uh, um, and, and why we're making those decisions. And so I'm going to use this paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019 as a framework for how I'm going to uh, discuss this talk. In this review, they discuss 13 equations, or they, they present 13 equations, and they discuss four areas, cardiology, obstetrics, urology, and nephrology, and I'll go through each of those uh, discussions individually. But before we start that, we all have to have a basic understanding of the statistics of prediction. Because ultimately, that's what we want to do. We want to categorize someone as to falling into uh, one adverse event category versus another, for instance. And part that goes back to study design. So when you're evaluating clinical research studies that you see in the New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of the American Academy, of sciences, you need to look at the study design. Is it a randomized controlled clinical design, which is the gold standard, or is it as an observational study? When we look at randomized clinical designs, we have factors that we are interested in. One of those may be race, and one of those may be age uh, or gender. And so we assure that we have equal representation through a randomization process, and we look at table one, which is typically the demographics, to see if the randomization was successful. And we see, look at that, uh, the statistics in, demograph in the demographic tables, to show that the two populations are similar, and so that the intervention that we're applying uh, is uniformly applied to those populations. And then we do a statistical analysis of the primary objective. In That's observational great. studies, which a large number of the papers that we're going to talk about today uh, we could have case control, so we could have patients that uh, received a kidney transplant or didn't receive a kidney transplant. When we look at the demographic tables in those, we're likely to see differences in some of the factors that we um, have gathered. Now, those differences should prompt us to ask the question, why? Why is there a difference between these two, pa these two patient populations? And it may be something that's steeped in, in history, where we've always done something one way, but we haven't really reevaluated it. But when it comes to the statistical analysis of those data, we, ha we typically have to do an adjustment. So you will see in the paper an unadjusted statistic, and this is the, the factor that they're looking at of interest, not adjusted for the other factors in the equation, and then the adjusted. So the adjusted is really an attempt to get around the fact that we didn't have randomization. So we do adjusted, we do statistical analysis to, to uh, try to make uh, amends for that, but these are really just observational studies. So here's some data, and it's data that we have in our, our dialysis unit. So we're looking at the hemoglobin concentration uh, related to the erythropoietin dose, and if one looks at this and does a statistical analysis, one might conclude that increasing erythropoietin dose leads to decreased hemoglobin concentration, and we know that there's probably something wrong with that. So we have to ask the question, why is the data look like this? And when we asked that question, and we looked at where individual patients lay within that distribution, we saw that we had about five groups of individuals that had extreme hypo response and extreme hyper response. And so we see the expected dose response curves in these populations, but by looking at the data unadjusted, we might reach the wrong conclusion. So the next thing that I want to talk about is how do we determine if a predictor is a good predictor or not? And that typically is presented to the reader 
using this term a receiver operating characteristics curve or an ROC curve. And it's a graphic display that shows true positive rate versus false positive rate, where the area end of the curve, if it's equal to one, means that the test is perfectly sensitive and perfectly uh, specific. But if the number is more towards the value of 0.5, it's just like looking at the patient and tossing the coin and determining what their outcome would be. So as an example of that, here's how we, use, here's how we uh, looked at a panel of cytokines in a pediatric patient population to predict steroid sensitive patients. So uh, in collaboration with uh, the people in, uh, at University of Ohio, we have this cytokine panel and we know if the patient was steroid sensitive or resistant. And so this just shows the model building process where we had started with about 13 cytokines and we created a model with that using uh, logistic regression, which is which we uh, um, using a term called backward elimination. So it looks at each one of these cytokines and it determines which one's the least important and removes it, then tests the model to see if the model changed statistically or not. And uh, we fall through that process until we reach the final model. And as you can see, as we do that, we can see that the ROC curve actually falls, but as the, the model becomes more statistically important or parsimonious, that means that some of these other cytokines really are just fitting error and not fitting the actual signal. As I mentioned before, we can have uh, univariate uh, statistics. So this is the uh, uh, different cytokines that predict steroid sensitivity. And then this is the, just the different models as we combine those together to look at them. And so this is going to be very similar to the process that we used by Levy when he uh, determined the EGFR equation that's currently used called CKD EPI. So that's the reason I present that, to go through the rationale and how uh, those data are determined. So in mathematical terms, we have the two terms bias and precision. And so you can think of that as you're going to the target range and you're uh, uh, taking your bow and arrow out and you're uh, shooting and you get a nice tight cluster. That means that it's very precise, but it's biased. That means you're always aiming high and to the right. Once again, we can still have bias of aiming high and to the right, but it's imprecise. We're all over the place. An unbiased and pre pre precise evaluation has this tendency where we, we have uh, everything clustered around the center, but then we can also have an unbiased uh, measure, but imprecise. And I think the uh, estimating equations for glomerular filtration rate probably fall more into this care, uh, category than to this category, and that's a problem that needs to be addressed. Now, there's a difference between something being statistically significant and clinically significant. So I could be walking down the street and uh, in the middle of a Three Stooges uh, show and there's a group walking by and a, a, a piano is falling on them. And I could say this is a 1945 era grand piano falling at 9.8 meters squared and your family should move expeditiously when what I really need to say is look out. So sometimes we will find things and we'll be very precise and we can be precise when we have large data sets of 100,000 people, but you have to judge whether that difference found in the statistical model is significant to your patient population. So now let's go back to the review article and the first uh, uh, um, item that they talked about was in cardiology and it's the American Heart Association Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure Risk Score published by Peterson. Now this predicts in hospital mortality and the risk of status stratification is used to inform clinical decision making and they are assigned zero to 100 points. They are assigned for blood pressure, BUN, sodium, age, heart rate, non-black race and COPD. So I put the number in here for the non-black race of, of three just to identify that this is maybe something that showed up as statistically significant, but may not be clinically significant. And so uh, the, the contribution of whether someone uh, is expected to have a greater in-hospital mortality, uh, this only per, uh, contributes 3%. 
And so the author of the New England Journal of Medicine review article concluded that following the guideline could direct care from black patients. In a retrospective study that then the authors in the New England Journal of Medicine paper reference as uh, how this may be uh, uh, impacting patients, they, there was a retrospective cohort study of patients admitted to card cardiology or general medicine. In the study, they found that there were decreased admissions to cardiology service, that black, Latino, X, Latin X, female sex, and older age were uh, shown to have fewer admissions. And they concluded that the admission to cardiology led to fewer, fewer readmissions. However, in the New England Journal of Medicine article, they failed to uh, show what Everly saw was that in their statistical analysis, there was no impact of race on readmission. So uh, whenever you have a review article, and if, if it's something that, that you're specifically interested, you really need to go to the source documentation and read that paper for yourself to reach your own conclusions. The next example was obstetrics. And in this case, they're looking at vaginal birth after cesarean section. And it's an algorithm that was published in 2005. In, uh, in, in these cases, the red uh, text represent the um, information that was taken from that article. And then the black text is what was assumed by the New England Journal of Medicine uh, reviewers. And so what they did, remember when I talked about the demographic table, uh, table one, for an observational study like this, we might expect that there would be differences between the two groups. And so the authors pulled that uh, information out, or the, the reviewers pulled that information out and showed us in, in this paper that by the demographics in, in table one, African American and Hispanics had lower rate of success but also that the success was higher for marital status and insurance, and they said that it wasn't used in the algorithm. However, if you further read the, the, the uh, article, the 2005 article, the authors concluded that the following risk factors, previous obstetric history, required induction, and maternal BMI were the factors that they thought were most associated with whether or not you could have a successful trial of labor in an individual that had a prior cesarean section. So once again, um, I think you have to read some of this for yourself to re reach your own conclusions. The, uh, the next example that is somewhat related to nephrology uh, is the uh, STONE score. And so this um, STONE score was uh, published in 2014, and it was used to uh, predict uh, using a number of uh, identifiers, whether or not the patient had a, a stone. In this case, non-black race is, was assigned a three out of a 13. So in this case, race plays a more significant role than it did in the cardiology one. And when we look at the statistics that were used using that ROC number, we, saw, we see that logistic reg regression by itself has an AUC of 0.86, the STONE score has an AUC of 0.82 in validation. So they did an actual validation. They had another set of data that they then applied the STONE score to, and it had a 0.79. So they followed all the proper statistical techniques. They, they uh, came up with a score, and they validated it within their own population. There was then, an, in 2016, an external validation of that score where they uh, compared the STONE score to physicians, which is an important comparison to make, and they saw that the STONE score performed better than uh, physicians, but they concluded that it lacks sufficient accuracy to defer CT scan. Um, and then in a further review in the American Journal of Nephrology, they also pointed out that this study might be regional, reg regional in nature, and so the bottom line on this, if you read all, all the information, um, get a stone, get a CT in everybody that has flank pain, regardless of their race. Um, so now let's go to nephrology. This is uh, uh, the area in which I exist, and uh, there is have been over time number of equations that estimate the glomerular filtration rate. 
the algorithm as used in our hospital and across the nation results in higher estimated GFR values for anyone identified as black race. Historically, this has been explained that blacks have more muscle mass than, than whites, and that really results in higher serum creatinines. Now, Levy, who is the author of these papers, gives three references that show uh, this finding that there was a, a higher muscle mass in the patients that they, they looked at. Now, that's in, that was the one paper that I looked at was in 80 patients, and so can you extrapolate from 80 patients to a whole population? Probably not. This review article references a study that shows patients that have a higher serum creatinine than whites uh, to demonstrate that this is a case, but it was done in hemodialysis patients, and I find that somewhat problematic, although this is the, the reference that the authors decided to use. Um, and they conclude that because of this uh, overestimation or this estimate that is higher in black patients to whites, that it may defer ref uh, referral to specialty care. So fortunately, in the nephrology uh, community, we have this database called the USRDS, which is the United States Renal Data Systems. And every year they have an annual report and they report things about incidence patients. So these are patients that are new to end-stage kidney disease. And in this case, we can see here are the, the uh, bar plots for a white patient and a black patient that had zero to six months um, referral to nephrology, six to 12 months referral. And so what we see is that in a black patient, there tends to be fewer people that have a referral to nephrology greater than 12 months. This is observational data. And once again, I can't draw conclusions. You need to ask the question, why are these data? More interestingly, and um, I had a discussion with George Aronoff, who was my mentor previously and is on the call. And we talked about this observation where we see that uh, black patients or African-American patients start dialysis or enter end-stage renal disease with a lower GFR on average than white patients. Now, if you take in the fact that we have an estimator that overestimates it, or that results in an estimate that is higher, one has to ask the question of what's going on here that results in these, these differences. Dr. Jacobs, who's the director of our dialysis unit, says he doesn't start anyone based on what their eGFR is. He based it on their uremic symptoms, fluid removals, and other factors independent of eGFR. And then the final example that they give in the New England Journal of Medicine um, um, article is this idea of the kidney donor risk index. And this is a number that's calculated from the donor kidney to see how acceptable it may be to uh, someone looking to, for a transplant. And it's data that's observationally based from 1995 to 2005. And what it found is if the donor is black, it makes the graft high risk and less suitable. So let's talk a, just a little bit about race. Now, remember, I'm a pharmacokineticist. I look at numbers. I'm a mathematician. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not a social scientist. Um, and so I'm looking at this in a little bit different way. And so I had to go in and look at the genetics literature, something I'm not that familiar with, but I found some interesting things. So the question is, what is race? Is race a phenotype? Does race, is it biology? Is it a social construct? It's certainly not a genotype. So if we were to go into everybody, we could genotype them and we could categorize them in that way. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the human uh, gen genome is identical. It's just that one base pair out of a thousand that makes us different. It's just that we have three billion base pairs that, are, that we need to look at. So can we group peoples based on their genetic code? And the answer is yes, in this science publication, which I found very interesting, they looked at um, 1,300 nuclear microsatellites micro in the DNA of individuals from 121 African populations 
four African American populations, 60 non African populations, and they took all 1,300 of those markers and they did what's called a principal component analysis. A principal component analysis takes those 1,300 markers and tries to combine them in unique number of ways to reduce us from 1,300 to a lower number that we can then use to make um, uh, predictions on. And in this case, they were able to reduce that 1,300 number down to 72 principal components, of which principal component one results in, uh, explains 19.5% of the variability in those markers. And as you can see here, uh, we have uh, those markers, those principal components from the global community and from Africa specifically. And as you can see, there is some good um, linearity of individuals in Africa, in Western, Central, and Southern Africa. So those individuals are more alike than those in Eastern Africa. They're not at all like by those in Tanzania or uh, the group that are in pygmies. And I looked that up before uh, to find out where that was, and it's kind of Central Africa. Um, but what we see in the uh, population through the world, we have the sub-Saharan Africans and African Americans. So African Americans track well with sub-Saharan Africans, and this makes complete sense, and we'll see that on the next slide where we look at a, uh, a, um, a marker of disease in nephrology that was discovered maybe 10 years ago called ApoL1. And ApoL1, the ApoL1 variant, is associated with focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And it's a variant that conferred enhanced protection against the virulent subspecies of tryptosomes. And those uh, pet, uh, parasites are found in this area of Africa. So it makes sense that this information, these individuals that uh, uh, tended to be the, the individuals that were brought to the New World during the slave trade show up in this part of the world and in the United States. Now it was recommended uh, by the New England Journal of Medicine people that we might use ApoL1 as an ancestry marker. Unfortunately, the prevalence of those alleles uh, is only a little bit greater than 10%, so it's not really a marker of, of, of ancestry per se, but it certainly is uh, something that we use to identify every day in our clinic uh, if the patient has uh, an ApoL1 associated um, disease. So, why did I even get interested in this? Uh, or why did why was I even aware that there was a controversy? I, it was from this this uh, paper that comes from the ASN called Kidney News, and I usually just look at it uh, briefly and, and throw it in a pile. But this one caught my eye because medical students were leading an effort to remove race from the kidney function estimates, and I it piqued my curiosity as well as it has at the the university here because you're all looking at it as well. So the ASN. Uh, has responded to that and has formed a committee to investigate the use of race in, in uh, estimating glomerular filtration rate. And they have their first report out, which just says, this is what we're going to do and this is what we're going to look at. And so they haven't reached a conclusion. So I assume in about a year, we'll have a conclusion from the ASN of what to do. Why do we, uh, why do we measure ES, e, e, EGFR in our patient populations? because we staged them. And anyone that's stage three should be, uh, we should be seeking a nephrology referral to, for stage three kidney disease to evaluate whether or not something else needs to be done. So in order to understand uh, how these EGFR equations work, we have to talk about creatinine. So creatinine is formed from creatine by creatinine kinase to phosphocreatine where it exists in the muscle as an energy source and the breakdown product of that is creatinine. It's dependent on muscle mass and uh, the liver, pancreas, and kidney make about one gram per day of creatine. 
So it's not just muscle, but it's also other sources of creatine that can end up as creatinine. It's a waste product. It's present in all body fluids, filtered through the glomeruli, and excreted in the urine. This is a nephron for those of you that don't know. If you don't know, then Dr. Youssef has a lot of work ahead of her. But creatinine is filtered at the glomerulus into the tubule, where it's also secreted using organic cation transporters and organic anion transporters into the tubule and ends up in the urine. We have a gold standard that measures glomerular filtration rate, and that is uh, inulin and iothalamate. You use I-125 iothalamate. And the, the advantage of this is that it is all filtration. There is no secretion or reabsorption. So when 0.5 millimole enter the uh, um, Bowman's capsule and into the uh, tubules, 0.5 end up in the urine. And so we can make a comparison of measured glomerular filtration rate using inulin or alphalmate to the estimate, and that's exactly what they did. Why is creatinine, why do we use creatinine? Here's a micropuncture study where they take a little tubule, a, a little pipette, and they stick it into the different portions of the nephron, the proximal tubule, Lupa Henle, and they can measure all these different electrolytes and, and glucose and proteins. And they found that uh, inulin and creatinine match each other very well. And so naturally, we would use those that, that agent to make these predictions. And in the 70s, uh, the equation that was used was cockroft gall and if we go all the way back to my second slide or my third slide where I showed the book Drug Dosing and Renal Failure, a lot of the equations, a lot of the recommendations were based on the cockroft gall creatinine clearance. In 1999, 1999, we looked at the modification of diet and renal disease study where they measured in a group of patients IL thalamate and they measured serum creatinine and they came up with the first equation to estimate GFR. And that was revised in 2009 using the CKD EPE. And that's the one that's currently being used. Serum creatinine that you observe in your patient is a balancing act between elimination, which is glomerular filtration, and creatinine generation. So if someone's serum creatinine is changing, it's a balance of one of those two things. Serum creatinine can be raised in renal impairment, destruction of muscle, high intake meat, hypothyroidism, increase in musculature, drugs. It can be lowered in age, females, malnutrition, vegetarian diet, and hyperthyroidism. So you have to consider all of these factors if serum creatinine is changing. Most likely, it's due to renal impairment. And as I like to say, the biggest uh, contributor to chronic renal disease is age. Everybody, as they get older, lose renal function. So the equation, uh, the CKD, which is an uh, uh, epidemiology study, looked at, that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine 2009 by Levy, uh, was a cross-sectional analysis of separate pooled databases that um, had 2,800 or uh, 8,200 patients that they used to de develop the equation and 3,800 patients that they used to validate it. They did linear regression analysis to estimate the logarithm of the measured GFR from standardized creatinine, sex, race, and age. And the important thing is here in the uh, Cockroft and Gall. Creatinine measurement was not standardized, so if you went from lab to lab, you may get different numbers, which would then influence your eGFR. Now, nowadays, uh, creatinine is 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 uh, standardized. So here's a comparison. So we had we know that Cockroft Galt just really wasn't very well, uh, very good because it compared um, serum creatinine to creatinine clearance. Uh, MDRD was the next uh, was Gen two. Of, of that equation. And then CKD epi was gen, generation three. And we can see here, when we talk about uh, bias and precision, you can see that the MDRD was biased because it didn't really include a lot of people that had a, a measurement of a GFR greater than 60. And therefore, it was poorly identified in those ranges. They introduced to me this term P30. 
And P30 is a measure of how good a diagnostic marker is. And uh, P30, it means the percent of the estimates within 30% of the measure. And so this is kind of a, a rule of thumb for something. If it, it needs to be, uh, you need to hit, have a P30 of 90%. And as you can see, in, in this case, um, when we move from the MDRD study in all uh, all groups, we're increasing that. So we're actually getting a, doing a better and better job of, of, of predicting. And from a statistical scientific standpoint, these equations are valid given the data that they were derived from. However, you can see here, this is the estimated GFR versus the measured minus the estimated GFR. And so this is the line, the regression line, when you take into consideration age, gender, and race. You can see that it is less biased than the MDRD for, uh, for underestimating. And, um, but what you need to take away is the fact that there is somewhat of a lack of precision. And so I draw on here some lines. So this blue line is an estimated of 30, an estimated of 60. This is plus, uh, plus 15 mils per minute. This is, minus, this is minus 15 mils per minute. So when we're at 30, most of the data exists between plus or minus 15. When we're at 60, most of the data exists between plus and minus 30, or actually uh, maybe a little better than that. But uh, as you can see, precision is a problem. So the authors of the CKD epi equation concluded that single edu ed equation won't work in all populations. It was developed using pools of different study populations. Some findings may be study effects. There are few patients greater than 70, and the higher level of GFR patients is not representative of the general population. So by design, the studies were looking at patients that had CKD, and so uh, if you don't have CKD, you wouldn't have been in the uh, study, therefore the equations might be poor there. There are incomplete data sets on diabetes immunosuppression. Uh, it does not overcome serum creatinine as a filtration marker, and all equations should be used in caution. In a review of this, in Nature Review, uh, the, these uh, people, the, these authors reviewed uh, 70 studies on looking at estimated GFR versus measured GFR and found a persistence of substantial errors in all GFR estimating formula, suggesting that the problem lies with serum creatinine and cystatin C. I haven't mentioned cystatin C because cystatin C doesn't really bring a whole lot of uh, information to the, to the table. Um, and so we could have a completely different discussion about that. Um, they propose, uh, they, they say that the P30 is not a good estimate and they propose a P, P10. Um, when we look at uh, the CKD epi equation as it's applied to other races, we, here are the groups in the United States, in the United States that were evaluated. And you can see here that for black patients uh, with a GFR estimated greater than 90, it's woefully inadequate. Once again, that might be expected because there was very little representation in the data that was used to create the equation in that group of individuals. Where it, full, where it completely fails is in different populations. So this was generate, this was uh, in the United States. It does not at all extrapolate to the population in Japan or South Africa. So you cannot use the CKD epi in those populations. Now, I was gonna ask a question at the beginning and I forgot. Uh, Raise your hand, you don't, I can't see you, if you think we should remove race from estimation of GFR. And this, this is Andrew Levy telling us what will happen if we use the CKD epi equation and we just remove race what's uh, altogether for the African-American populations that were in the study. So this is 
the blue line is the uh, equation, the CKD-EPI equation for the black patients only with uh, some variability about that, uh, those measurements. And if we remove that, this is what happens. The equation, if you use the same equation that was, uh, uh, that was developed in these patients and you remove one of the factors that were uh, used to develop that, the equation is now no longer valid. So you can't remove race from the CKD-EPI equation and have it apply properly. So that's the biggest uh, uh, argument, I think, that one can use and say, we just can't remove race from the CKD-EPI. So what can we do? Well, Levy already has addressed that. So in, uh, I like this idea. This is the, the new visual abstract that is being uh, used in almost all clinical journals now. And so this is uh, their new take on a new panel to estimate EGFR excluding race from the analysis altogether. And so uh, this includes beta-2 microglobulin and beta-trace protein and not race, and they develop it in a diverse population. And here he shows the, the, the one minus the P30, so we really want, the, we want patients down, or the estimates to be down here around 10%. And as you can see, we're getting, we're getting very close to that. There still, however, is a bias in the population, but it has completely removed race from the marker. So what we need to do is we need to do studies uh, on new techniques to remove race and not just eliminate it from an equation that was derived by using that information. Now, I want to go back uh, one last time. You may, in your review, uh, the uh, residents and interns that are on this, this panel that are going to evaluate race, you may come across this paper. And I have some major problems with this paper. So in this, this case, these authors said that what we need to do, here's, here's the data. We have this idea of, of P30. And so that means if the patient has a measured GFR, or an estimated, well, measured GFR of, of 60, their estimate could be anywhere from 42 to 78. Obviously, there's a lot of variability involved. But you need to remember that that's always the case, that we in, when we estimate GFR, there's always some substantial variability involved. They recommend going to this P10 measure, which obviously this would be much better, and I would applaud anyone that could come up with a measure that uh, estimates GFR to within uh, the P10 uh, between 54 and 66. But that still doesn't solve the problem because we have some uh, uh, um, decisions that we make based on eGFR. And one of those is waitlisting individuals for transplant. Currently, the guidelines state that when an individual reaches an eGFR of 20 mils per minute, they can be waitlisted. And if one were to go back and look at the uh, CKD epi equation, you can see that African American patients. Uh, have, for the same serum creatinine, will have a higher eGFR and therefore may not be put on the wait list as soon as a patient that's white with the same serum creatinine. But we're still talking about a 10 mil per minute difference here. So it is kind of uh, short-sighted to set hard um, goals of like 20 mils per minute. And in fact, there's a paper that you may review that shows that uh, the, the preferred, meth, the preferred uh, uh, listing should be that African Americans should be placed on the list at 25 and Caucasians or white patients at 20 because uh, a patient, uh, two patients, an African American patient and a, a Caucasian patient that have a GFR of 20 uh, typically, the African-American patient will uh, reach ESRD quicker than that same white patient. So there are problems, 
they need to be addressed. Uh, a hard a hard coding of an EGFR of 20 is probably needs to be reevaluated. So this is the this is the uh, one um, diagram that I put the at the very beginning. I put in that. Uh, plot of erythropoietin dose and hemoglobin because when we looked at that we reached a conclusion we may have reached a conclusion that giving more erythropoietin leads to lower hemoglobin there's the same problem with this data that this author is showing these are all the measure these are all the estimated uh, the serum creatinines for measured GFRs uh, across this population and we don't know if there's any uh, um, um, which group or which populations show. So what, they, what they're trying to make the point here is that a, at a serum creatinine of 1.5, your measured GFR can be anywhere from 30 to 90. And we know that that's true on the surface, but if we start looking at, uh, let's say that we really did know what someone's muscle mass was and that we corrected for the true muscle mass difference, we would get subpopulations in this. So this is true in the population at whole, but it may not be true in your one patient. Levy identified four major concerns with this perspective. And the first one was that the measure, the iothalamate clearance and inulin clearance that we're using as the gold standard doesn't meet the requirements of that P10. So day-to-day -day, uh, differences in GFR uh, collection problems. There's there is residual variability in the est in the measured GFR that doesn't allow us to reach the the level of uh, significance of this individual. So in the end, you have three patients in your clinic, uh, and they all have a serum creatinine of 1.2. The only one that we really need to worry about is this woman because she has a this was the MDRD, but uh, she has a, a GFR estimated of 46, and so we might seek a referral to nephrology to uh, follow her. But certainly, what you need to do is you can't rely just on one estimate of GFR. You have to follow the patient serially through time and look at how rapidly their, their renal function is decreasing and then refer them to specialty care if it's falling rapidly. If, it's, if they're maintaining their GFR year to year to year, you can probably follow them. But if they're, if they're decreasing, then you probably need to refer them to subspecialty care. So in the uh, one paper by uh, Sue, who looked at uh, serum creatinine in patients on dialysis that we talked about earlier, uh, in his discussion, he had a good summary of black race in nephrology. And I just pulled this information from him. So black African Americans or black race are overrepresented in the ESKD population. Prevalence of mild to moderate CKD is roughly equivalent between race and so uh, we need to really focus in on those uh, patients that have a uh, more severe form and start making decisions there. Black race is more likely to progress to ESKD. They're less likely to receive a kidney transplant. They fare far worse after transplantation. Lower overall risk for death in ESKD despite worse risk factors. So what we see is black race has a survival advantage once they reach ESKD. They have more adverse social economic factors. They have a higher prevalence of anemia. They have fewer arterial venous fistulas, which is the best, which is the gold standard for dialysis access. And they have a lower dose of dialysis. So race is important to nephrology. We know and our physicians in the nephrology division know all of this information and they take that into consideration when they evaluate each patient. As George Aronoff has taught me 
over and over again. I, I consider myself a population pharmacokineticist. But he tells me over and again that, Mike, I don't treat a population. I treat individual patients. So you have to make decisions on all of this information, on EGFR, on your specific patient, and see whether or not they fit within the guidelines of whether to use that information. So in conclusion, bias is the systemic deviation from truth, and the estimating equations have improved on removing bias. I'm not talking about racial bias, I'm talking about mathematical bias. And in all measures of using these estimating equations, bias has decreased. Precision, however, is the accuracy of the prediction and I haven't seen much increase in precision, and there's likely not to be much increase in precision. The estimating equations minimize the variance in the relationship between the estimated GFR and the measured GFR using race, age, race, sex, estimates of body size, and cystatin C if you use the CKD epi cystatin C equation. The equations are not explanatory. The biggest complaint that I saw in reviewing this is that they, we have an equation, but it doesn't explain why these things occur. That happens all the time in medicine. We see, uh, we, we uh, develop a database, we look at it, we ask a question of it, of why. The equation is the part that prompts us to ask why is this different. It's up to us to do the research to determine why that is. The reasons that are attributed to race are hypothesized, and no one should uh, take away from these equations that body mass is really the answer, although there are some studies that say that's true, and there are studies that say that's not true, and so we need more studies. If there is bias, it is how the estimates are applied and not the values generated. And I go back to the listing of patients on, on the transplant list. Someone decided that they were going to choose 20 as, a, as a, a, a time to put someone on a wait list, but they didn't really consider how that impacts the African American population who reach the need for dialysis sooner than the white patient, the similar white patient at 20. All aspects of your patient need to be considered in your history, physical, and differential diagnosis, and following the progression and determine the rate and fall of EGFR. And if you're interested, uh, I'm gonna have this on there. You can look at the NIDDK, and they have a nice page on estimating glomerular filtration rate, and you can you can look at look at that for further information. And so uh, I will stop there, and I already see that Jenny has a question for me. So let's see, it says, based on the fact that black patients are more likely to progress to ESRD and have worse outcomes after transplant, wouldn't that argue that we should be diagnosing earlier, not using the race-based EGFR, so that we can be more aggressive in trying to prevent progression? Absolutely, we need to be more aggressive in trying to prevent progression. And that begins uh, likely at the diagnosis of diabetes and hypertension in any individual. And we need to treat their diabetes and hypertension. By the time that the EGFR equations really become useful, it's probably too late. But what I, what I wanna say is, if I, if I go out and I do a study where I'm only going to look at EG, uh, EGFR in African Americans and I come up with an equation, I wouldn't come up with that different of an equation than they already came up with. So it's not really a problem with the equation. The problem is how uh, we look at the progression, the fact that the African-American population progressed that more rapidly to ESKD, the fact that they have um, a greater prevalence once they reach ESKD, um, the precision of the equation doesn't allow us to be that fine-tuned. And so um, from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, because that's the where I, where I deal, um, 
you know, we may make a recommendation for stage three CKD and stage two CKD, but there can be people that cross over. But because someone has decided that uh, we're going to take something that's linear, a linear relationship and categorize it, we lose information from that. So um, if that hasn't answered your question, you can go ahead and type something in. But I'm looking at these and anybody else has any questions, I'll look at the uh, chat and um, be happy to talk to anybody else afterwards too. Hi, um, this is Loretta Joplin, uh, Transplant Hepatology. Um, I have a question about um, utilization of IOS element clearance. Um, I've used that to previously estimate folks who um, we anticipate may need a kidney transplant um, in a safety net. Um, and I found that it, it, it appears to perform better than serum creatinine. You know, women have lower muscle mass, and so they're right. going to be disadvantaged. Um, and men have worsening sarcopenia during cirrhosis. And, um, and so relatively, they, they have um, lower creatinine despite their uh, worsening overall functional status. So can you speak to IOS element clearance and how we could use that in the future? Absolutely, you're exactly right. And one of the things that, uh, uh, um, when I was going through this talk 15 times before, one of the things that I wanted to say is if you really need to know something about their glomerular filtration rate, you need to do an IOTALMATE clearance if it's that important. And I, was, I told Jacobs that I need to find out what the uh, uh, code is at University Hospital order that because that's, the, that's exactly what you need to do. And uh, there are um, op new options coming out at the University, Indiana University, uh, one of the nephrologists there has uh, uh, come up with even a, a, a better um, method that doesn't have all of the um, um, uh, methodology associated with it to measure e e G or measuring GFR. So yes, IOTHALMATE is an excellent one to use, but remember also the variability today, you may have somebody that gives a, if you did IOTHALMATE today, it may be 30, tomorrow it may be 35. Uh, Using the the uh, part about waitlisting patients for kidney transplant, if somebody's 19, they get waitlisted. If they're 22, they don't get waitlisted. So um, the, there's inherent variability, but you're absolutely right to do what you've done. Hey, Mike, uh, this is a uh, Hitar Dave. Can I comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, hi, uh, everyone. This is uh, Hitar Dave. I'm with uh, I'm uh, one of the transplant nephrologists uh, here. Uh, so. Uh, Couple of things about so yes, IOTelemet is is a uh, is a much better um, way to test uh, GFR, and we have tried to uh, get this testing done for for donor evaluation. Um, the, the issue is that uh, uh, again, it's uh, you know we we use it so you know sparingly or sporadically, uh, the, and it's uh, I think the radiology has to order in in in, in a batch. Uh, and if you don't use it within a certain time frame, it kind of goes to waste and it's expensive. So I, I think that's one of the reasons we have not been able to get that test here at uh, university and Jewish. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, Loretta, to answer your, your question, uh, 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 so the other thing, yes, you know, with cirrhosis, uh, you know, they, they all have sarcopenia and, and, uh, and the EGFR is usually uh, overestimated uh, based on their, uh, you know, falsely low creatinine. Uh, so we have kind of, we have used, uh, uh, you know, cystatin C in, in some of these patients to, uh, uh, to kind of see what their true, uh, true GFR is. Uh, uh, but again, that's also uh, the, the issue with the cystatin C is uh, if, if the renal function is fluctuating, uh, you're not going to be able to get an accurate GFR even with cystatin C. Uh, so uh, I think the, those those are uh, the the you know the the limits to that cyst using cystatin C for uh, to kind of est estimating that their GFR rather than creatinine. Okay, so uh, I, I I see a follow up question from Jenny, and so she her concern is that. Uh, one of my other questions is that the fact that race is a social construct, what about what constitutes black? And of course, that's the reason that I showed uh, President Obama because we know his ancestry 
his father is African and his mother is uh, white. Uh, and so is he, is he African American? Is he black? What, how does he categorize? Um, is this based on patient identification? And, abs and it was. In the, in the studies that we referenced, uh, uh, one, uh, they, 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 they specifically indicate that the uh, racial categorization was based on what the, the patient considered. Uh, so the question is about, of the eyeball test. Um, I was going to, uh, because uh, um, I follow the Kardashians religiously, uh, I was going to put pictures. I don't follow the Kardashians. But sometimes the eyeball test does not pass, and you are right. Uh, the other question is, are those of uh, Caribbean descent the same as Sub-Saharan Africans? And, and that answer, when we look at the ApoL1 uh, uh, data and, and migration patterns, they, they would fall into that same category. Um, then um, uh, should we use those as biracial ancestry to be considered black or not? Um, so this is this is where I I, I have to, to have to punt because uh, I'm like I said I'm not a geneticist. But the important thing is uh, the interesting thing is when I when I looked at things, people I individuals uh, from Africa have the greatest genetic diversity. So in fact. Uh, if we were to use the term wild type, uh, pa patients from uh, Africa are more the wild type in patient and, and subjects from uh, uh, Northern Europe or, or Western Europe are more of a, uh, um, a uh, uh, more genetically uh, similar population. So uh, it is a tough question when you enter race into it because a person from South Africa is very different than someone from the Saharan Africa. Just like um, if you remember that principal component analysis, uh, the similar, the, the dispersion in Africa is much greater than it is in any other part of the world. And so it's a tough question. I don't have a readily answer for that. Anything else? All right. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody has any, you have a last chance here, if you want to, you can type something in the chat area. If you want to unmute your mic and ask a quick question, um, go right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the final comment was that the way that it's applied, uh, uh, the buy that we're playing is based on the physician. They will be the ones using it. Um, you know, um, Obviously, if you have, um, I'm trying, let me, let's say LeBron James walks in, uh, or I was going to say Kevin Hart, but Kevin Hart's pretty buff. Uh, but, but from a size standpoint, those two are completely different individuals, but they would both be called African American. And so you might, uh, see a, you might see a higher serum creatinine in LeBron James than you do in, in uh, uh, um, uh, Kevin Hart. And so you, you, you you have to look at that and take that into con consideration, certainly. Uh, anybody that's on a, on a pro football team or even a pro athlete is probably going to skew your population. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at President Obama, for instance, he weighs 175 pounds, he's 6'2". I used to weigh 175 pounds and 6'2", but I'm not that anymore. Uh, so he may not fit the uh, uh, racial categorization in the same way and so you have to have to use that but uh, in the equations that were used they said are you white are you black and when they when they do the analysis there's enough information in that binary predictor to re to decrease the variability but in the end should we remove race from EGFR predictions absolutely and I think that we have some uh, techniques that are doing that. Should we remove it from the CKD epi equation that we're using now in our population? I don't think so, because I think that that seriously will uh, underestimate the glomerular filtration in, in the average African-American patient. And certainly from my standpoint, that could lead to serious complications with drug dosing. Thanks.
33 people left. Somebody's, somebody's hanging around waiting for something. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Breyer. This is definitely eye-opening. So uh, um, anyway, just uh, thank you again, and uh, thank Dr. Rousseff. It's good to see her again, and Dr. Aronoff and uh, everybody. And uh, we'll be back again next week, uh, April 29th. I believe actually Dr. Kruger will be doing a presentation on C. diff. Uh, which will be very timely and uh, always very pertinent. So, uh, again, thank you, Dr. Breyer. This is this is wonderful. All right, thanks. All right, thanks so much, and thank you, everybody, again. Uh, next next week, uh, same time, 8 a.m. Thursday, and uh, we'll hear from the hear from the chair. So, take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. And uh, Tim, I remember to download the thing. <laughs>